Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. My name is Dave Kading, and I'm excited about this particular podcast because it is a full-length lecture uh, called Implementing Myopia Management into Your Practice. It is a re-recording of a webinar that I did on August 31st, 2021. And uh, one of the most sought-after topics that we have in, uh, in the podcast or talking to practitioners around the world is how do I incorporate myopia management into my practice? And as a listener of the myopia podcast, you're likely somebody who already has implemented myopia management. But if you have not, uh, this is, uh, this is a, uh, a rebroadcast of the webinar where we talk about many of the different things that you can do, how to discuss things with your staff, how to discuss uh, things with patients and so forth, and also with regards to marketing. And you'll see that I reference at the end of the webinar some questions that people had. Uh, and if you have specific questions, you can always DM me or reach out to me through email and uh, talk with me about things, regardless of when you listen to this particular podcast. So I hope you find something as valuable as the uh, couple hundred people who uh, signed up for this particular webinar. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thanks for joining us for this uh, this webinar. This is uh, put on by the Myopia Podcast. Uh, many of you have uh, have joined us for the podcast. We're really excited that you uh, have taken part. Some really really cool stuff I've learned uh, as the host of the podcast, and I hope you have uh, learned some things as well. If you haven't yet heard about or uh, or signed in for the podcast, you can download it. You can click the link here or take a picture or scan it with your, your camera. Uh, and then, uh, and I'll have this later on as well. Um, and we're also on all of the podcast formats, uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify, all of them. So if you listen to podcasts, you'll be able to find us. Just search for Optometric Insights Media. Uh, Optometric Insights Media puts out the podcast, uh, the Myopia podcast. So we're super excited to have all of you. Uh, as we're getting started, I want to mention that uh, we have special thanks to Euclid for their unrestricted educational grant of uh, the Myopia podcast, uh, several episodes, which I'll share with you here in a moment, as well as this particular webinar. Uh, Euclid has just launched, if you haven't heard, something called Euclid Max, which is uh, one of the latest breakthroughs in overnight orthokeratology. It combines Euclid's design, which uh, has been around for a very long time, uh, I, I believe, I don't, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's the number one orthokeratology design in the world. Uh, it combines that with material properties, uh, a balance of the high DK as well as uh, a, a highest DK of any overnight ortho -K brand in the United States. Um, as a listener of the podcast and a webinar participant, Euclid is offering a free set of lenses to anyone who is getting certified by the end of October of this year. Just mention that you follow the Myopia podcast to their consultation team uh, and you'll receive a free set of lenses. So that is very cool. Um, we're very, very uh, proud that, uh, that Euclid is supporting and is seeing the value of this particular podcast. Uh, um, I'm assuming everybody can hear me. We just wanted to make sure as we were getting started that everybody could. I want to mention, we just did this poll, which many of you have seen. 76% uh, of you that are, uh, that are joining us today are just starting your journey on myopia management, have been doing it for less than two years. 11% uh, have been doing it uh, for more than two years. And, uh, and, and less than 10, several of you are, uh, are old hats that 4% uh, have been doing it for more than 10 years. So very excited to have all of you on board with us. So wanted to uh, just mention here, as we're also getting started, several of the episodes that we have done as part of the podcast, these were the ones that we launched in August 
and we're launching one coming up with AFE uh, September 1st. So uh, we'd love to have you join forces with the Myopia podcast, stay up to date on some of the new, newest and coolest things that are going on in myopia, of which I'll mention a couple of them here. So as we're looking into myopia management, I think the first thing we need to kind of talk about is what is myopia management? Uh, I've talked to people and they've been like, oh yeah, I've been doing myopia management for years. I prescribe glasses all the time for myopia management. So let's be clear that we all correct myopia as eye care providers, but there's a difference between being uh, somebody who corrects refractive error and proactively stops or slows the progression of myopia. And we're talking about being somebody who alters, manipulates, modifies refractive error for our patients, similar to how we modify, manipulate, uh, or correct disease like glaucoma, macular degeneration for our patients, right? Macular degeneration is a great example um, where we can't necessarily keep somebody from getting it, but we do work to try to slow down the progression of it. And, you know, really where we're at is that the, the greatest challenge around myopia is not the treatments that we have. We have phenomenal treatments, but it's our refusal to call myopia a disease. And I hope that you see that as we start this conversation. Um, you know, and as, as many of you, as I've talked talk to people around the, the United States, around the world, as I've traveled, some of the biggest obstacles that I've seen is that people are not prepared or they don't know how to go about it. They don't have their team, they're at their office buying into it. Some people say, oh, well, I tried incorporating, but you know, my, my team wasn't really comfortable with this, that, or the other thing. People aren't marketing to get people into their office. They see that it's too complicated. But I think the number one reason why those of us who are trying to do it are not succeeding is because we don't have a true buy-in about the disease of myopia. And the reality is myopia is the other pandemic that's going around. Uh, it's, it's on the rise as much as ever. Myopia is a, uh, a major disease. We look at its prevalence and its progression here over the last couple of uh, years, even since the 1970s, there's been a 66% increase in myopia uh, in the United States. And, uh, you know, worldwide, we've a, a significant percentage of you are from outside of the United States, from all over the world. I'm really honored that you would join us. Um, the reality is it's on the rise worldwide. And the statistics as we look country by country are astronomical. 97% in South Korea, right, uh, is, is one of the, the most astounding. But worldwide, in the United States, it's almost at 50% um, in a substantial percentage of our population. Not as high as some in some Asian countries, but uh, still very, very high. And also, in addition to it being on the rise, we see publications just exploding with information around myopia. Um, between 2019 and two, in the mid-2020, there were over a thousand papers that were published uh, on myopia. A thousand papers on myopia. That's just incredible. One of the other things as we look at the literature is there's over 4,000 definitions of myopia in the literature, variability between what people describe as myopia or high myopia. And this nuance around myopia is something I really wanted to dig into. And so there's an organization called the International Myopia Institute, if you're not familiar with them, an incredible resource on the scientific side of myopia. And I had the honor and pleasure of interviewing uh, Dr. Monica Young, and her podcast is going to be released at the end of September. So look for that podcast. But some incredible information. They summarized a lot of these papers in a, a digest that they did called the, the White Papers, the International Myopia Institute uh, white papers of 2021 was published, and I would highly encourage you to uh, to look into that. So is there a safe level of myopia? When I was in optometry school, I was celebrated for having a refractive error of minus one and a half. 
you know, when I become presbyopic, it's going to be this nice thing to have. And, uh, you know, we think, well, you know, my father is a minus two, 250. So he takes his glasses off to read. And some people might say, oh, that's the perfect refractive error. But is there a level of myopia where it's a good thing to have it? And I, I, I would never have thought that any one of my professors would have knowingly told me, congratulations for your refractive error. It puts you at a two times greater likelihood of developing glaucoma, a three times greater likelihood of developing a retinal detachment. Now, naturally, that may not seem that big of a deal. If you're a high myope and your risks of these diseases are so much higher, such an incredible thing uh, that Flitcroft's paper really brought out to us with regards to the severity of the disease of myopia and that there is no amount that we want our patients to have. Each diopter matters. In fact, uh, Mark Bullimore and Noel Brennan put together some statistical analysis of some papers that have been done looking at the risk factors. And each additional diopter of myopia is associated with a 58% increased risk of maculopathy, 20% greater risk of open angle glaucoma, a 21% posterior subcapsular cataract, and a 30% increase in a retinal detachment. What's that, what that means is that as you go from a one diopter to a two diopter, your risks increase by 58% for maculopathy. As you go from a two to a three, they increase an additional 58%. And it continues on from there as those risk factors. So how good is it to keep a child from become, going from a one to a two? Well, you reduce their risks of developing maculopathy by 58% for every diopter. And that's critical as we look at how early should we intervene. The important thing that I'm hoping we're all on the same page, and if you're taking some time to spend with me this evening, uh, I know that you are also in the same camp, is that you will not be successful with myopia management unless you see it as a disease, unless you understand that it's on the rise, that we can slow it down, and it's not hard. It's very easy to implement myopia management. To do myopia management into your office is very, is, is doing it is an easy thing. Implementing it may be something that we'll try to tackle and simplify a little bit today. Failure is an, op an option for us. We can't fail in this. And the reality is that if we don't believe that myopia is a disease, we're not going to succeed in implementing it into your practice. If your intention is to get into myopia management because you have heard that it is financially rewarding, which it is, but you don't believe it to be a disease, you will not succeed. Uh, people will find you out. They will know that it's not something that you care. But if you truly believe that it is a disease, there is no way that you will fail. That's the reality of it. So I want to ask this question as the polls as we're, we're, uh, we're talking about some treatment options. Many of you know the treatment options that are out there, and I'm, I'm proud and happy to talk with you about all of these things in greater depth. But uh, it, the reality is we have to understand, would you click all of the choices that you do? So there's going to be many different answers. You can click more than one choice here. So please uh, select all that apply for you. Um, so my site, a very uh, important part of our world's myopia management uh, here in the United States being the first product to get FDA approval. Uh, so a, a big one here. Um, if you don't know much about my site, uh, I'm proud to have uh, Justin Kwan on the Myopia podcast on the September 15th episode. We're going to be talking about, uh, about it with him. Um, and so that's going to really be kind of, kind of unique and kind of a cool uh, podcast because Noel Brennan, uh, excuse me, because Justin Kwan was in private practice and uh, is now working at Cooper Vision. My site shows some substantial reduction in, in, in the progression of myopia. As many of you know, first FDA approved product. There also is another soft multifocal lens that is on the market, not FDA approved, but is showing some good data and slowing down the progression of myopia. Studies continue to come out. And uh, for higher refractive errors, this is a great product 
for, for our patients to consider. Um, and then one that we are not utilizing in the United States yet is spectacle lenses. Uh, these defocus incorporated lenses, as you can see, there's multiple different products on the market. Uh, they're not available in the United States, but internationally, many of you may be using them in your practice. In fact, 34% uh, of you are utilizing spectacle lenses in your practice. So that's a, a pretty profound number. That's pretty exciting to see. Uh, and we've got multiple products. We've, we've got pro a product approved in the United States, but has not been launched yet. So that is very, very exciting. And then atropine. Atropine has been shown to, to have a substantial impact on the progression of myopia. I'm proud to see that 50% of you are utilizing it. 48% is what the, stud, the, the poll says here. Uh, are utilizing atropine in some way. If you're in the United States, here's four companies that uh, we've looked into that are doing it. There's more than just this, but this is four that we share with our local referring doctors um, that are out there and uh, approximately what it costs per month uh, for the patient to be on it. There is a preservative free option um, from some pharmacies, uh, a little bit more expensive for you to use those. And then, of course, orthokeratology. And when we speak about orthokeratology, there is many products that are on the market. Uh, but you do need to pick whether you're wanting to do empirical fitting, whether topography-based fitting or diagnostic fitting. Um, you know, shout out to Euclid. They uh, do a fantastic job on the empirical fitting. You send in the Ks and the Rx and the HVID, the horizontal visual iris diameter, and uh, basically just prescribe the lenses, not necessarily having to do a whole lot of fitting. It's as simple as that. Uh, with one study, they're showing, uh, you know, about 80, 85% success with the first set of lenses, and that's pretty high. Um, and then systems like the BE, basically where you use your topographer and it kind of guides you through the process. And then I think many of us are familiar with Paragon system, which can be empirical but also has a diagnostic fitting set should you decide that you want to. 58% of you are utilizing orthokeratology with your patients. Uh, so that was that 75% of you are utilizing soft multifocals, 50% of you are utilizing atropine, 58% of you are utilizing orthokeratology, 33% of you are utilizing custom myopia glasses. So obviously that shares the, uh, the high percentage of individuals outside the United States. Uh, quite a few Canadians on today, so happy to have you here. So I think one of the big obstacles that many of us have is what does the conversation with parents look like? And uh, having many of you done this already in some way, shape or form, uh, you know that that conversation is the critical aspect with it. So the quality of life success here with our, our patients in talking to the parents about their quality of life is so key and so critical uh, to talk to you, the parent about what it's like to have myopia. And many of them do, right? There's a three times greater risk of a child developing myopia if one of their parents does and it's six times greater if both of them do. So having that quality of life discussion of what it's like to have blurry vision. And if the parent is not myopic, you can show them in the exam room what that looks like utilizing uh, some of your diagnostic lenses. And then we do want to share with our patients the concern for the health and utilizing the statistics that I showed earlier. I don't think that scaring parents into doing myopia management is the direction we want to go, but we want to be upfront with them of that this isn't just a convenience thing. This isn't just to keep your child from having a high prescription. Having a high prescription means the eyeball is bigger. It's stretching. And utilizing those words are really key is the bigger. Uh, I don't like to always use the word longer. Um, it seems that when you say that the eyeball is getting bigger, it tends to have a more profound effect uh, because with that goes along the stretching of the eyeball in this entire stretching effect. And it talks about, and then you can talk about how that stretching effect has impacts 
for future eye disease over the lifetime for our child. And so the shorter we can keep the eye, the, the, the more we can help them reduce their risks of developing those diseases. But also having, uh, having myopia management is about helping them with their future prescriptions. It will put them in line potentially for having refractive correction. When they get into that four, five, six, seven, it's really hard to do refractive surgery. It's hard, much harder to do refractive surgery on those patients. You can talk with them about how there's less options for contact lenses and spectacle lenses become more difficult as well. And so as we can keep this prescription smaller, it brings about uh, a much bene- a, a lot of benefits for the patient. But also I think it's important to talk with the parent about myopia management is not just a product. We don't just fit the patient with a contact lens and that's the solution to it. No more than we consider an eye drop to be the process for solving glaucoma. There's a process that goes into solving glaucoma with frequent monitoring and management and switching products or adding products in. And we're not fitting your child with a contact lens in order to solve this problem. We are going to be enrolling your patient, your your child into this process, this myopia management program that we're going to be doing. It's not just a product that helps that. Um, it, and I had somebody in the, in the chat section remind me that it was an 87% first lens success uh, with the Yuka lens. Um, thank you very much, Karen, for reminding me of the SMART study. One other thing to talk about with our parents is the, uh, the seasonal effect. We had a podcast with Aif Vanderwert, which talked about the holistic approach to myopia management being more than just the correction of the myopia, but also looking at the the prevention of myopia. And we know that myopia progresses more in certain seasons of the year than others. And we believe that to be really be, uh, we don't know for sure from a literature standpoint, but what we are, uh, we are summarizing and believing to be the case is that it's really all about that outdoor time. Spending outdoor time for children tends to happen more in the summertime. And we, we want to follow this, this 20, 20, 120 rule. And that's 20 minutes on a computer, 20 minutes looking away and 120 minutes outside. So key for that. Dwight Ackerman, a, a good friend of the myopia world with a review of myopia management says the 2022 rule. I say the 2020 120 rule of 120 minutes outside. The screen time needs to go away. The reality is with our children spending so much time on screens with their, their uh, uh, schoolwork these days, it's just so critical for us to just remove them from it. A half hour outside of school work time should really be the limit. An hour uh, on screen time outside of uh, maybe on the weekends. The, the thing is getting your children outdoor. The, the picture that you're seeing uh, on the top of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the screen, if you're watching the webinar, for those of you that are listening as a podcast, I'm showing an image of my children who are doing Legos outside on my back patio. And they're just spending time enjoying the outdoors. They're still doing a near task. But the key here is not just that your child goes and runs up and down the street. That's good too, but that they spend time outside. My kids had spent the morning inside and my wife and I just said, you got to get outside. You got to spend time outside. So simple tasks of going and reading outside. Um, the studies don't give us a real clear understanding that it's just distance vision outside, but it's being outside with outside work. Now, when should we intervene? The answer is really as soon as we can. As soon as you start to see a child becoming myopic is so key But what we're also realizing is we could and should intervene in pre-myopia. If a child develops any amount of myopia by the six or seven years of age, they have a 6.6 times greater risk of developing a high prescription. 
So by intervening as they're becoming emetropic is key. If we see a child become emetropic at the age of five, we know they're on their way to high myopia because at six and seven, they will become myopic. If they are emetropic at six or seven in our offices, we're watching them very closely. We're doing the hygiene things. We're getting them outdoor. If they have a family member who is, uh, who is myopic, uh, a, a brother or a sister, um, and we know that the trend is that you tend to do similar activities, we start educating them early. And in some cases, some people may even start atropine in those early years, especially if a sibling is doing it. Now, that needs to be something you're comfortable doing, but that's something that we're comfortable doing in our practice with our patients. So when is it too late? When is it too early? Right. So we are still willing to start at a very early age. We have myopic uh, myopia management done in two and three year olds in our office. And uh, I saw a patient today in practice who is 19, who is continuing her myopia management. She is in uh, doing a neuroscience degree. And uh, her mother and I know that her, her other sister is a minus 10 and she's a minus seven and she's been stable for years. And we just decided we're going to keep going. Is she likely to progress? Not as likely as when she was younger, but she could progress some more. So we're continuing with her myopia management. Um, and, you know, speaking to those younger kids, really the younger, the better. Every diopter matters. So what do you need to incorporate or implement myopia management into your practice? Well, number one is I don't think you need any equipment at all. Um, I think having a phoropter and a slit lamp and a belief that myopia is a disease is all you need to get started. I personally wouldn't want to do myopia manage that way. I would like to have additional tools that would help me. Um, one of the best tools in my mind, because I do so much orthokeratology, either eight, about 80%, 80 to 85% of my patients are doing orthokeratology for myopia management. So I need a topographer. And if you're looking at incorporating myopia management or you're looking and wanting to know more about topography, uh, you can email me at, uh, doctor, uh, at Dave at Optometric Insights. And uh, I will talk with you about topographies and how to incorporate it into your practice, getting a good return on investment. Likewise, axial length is an important part of so many myopia management practices. I don't think it's critical that you start with that, but that's something that I think you should incorporate as time goes on and you start to develop your myopia practice. Similar to if you're really wanting to get into a glaucoma, I think it would be important for you to have an OCT, uh, but you may start treating glaucoma early on in practice, and then you would incorporate those technologies as you go on. So some important technologies that are out there, we just had an FDA clearance of the Oculus Myopia Master here in the United States. Those of you who are international have been utilizing it for years. It's got some really cool software built into it internationally that we hope to be able to bring into the Myopia Master here in the United States. So again, email me if you want more information about some of these technologies. So I wanted to talk a little bit and dig into what I think are some important things for how you can become successful by implementing myopia management into your practice. It sounds like the mass, vast majority are you are doing some myopia into your practice, and maybe it's not as, as, as much as you would like to do. Uh, and so how do you really kind of grow your myopia management practice? Just as a quick poll here, I'm curious for us to know how many patients you have in your practice that are doing myopia management. Uh, what does that look like right now in your practice? So first of all, I think it's so critical for you to have a team approach to myopia management for yourself and in your practice. It can't just be the doctor. It can't just be you know, one doctor in the team. You have to really incorporate and get the team on board. And so I think it's important to have a one to two hour meeting uh, at least once a year around myopia and why it's such a critical part of your practice. With that, I think you should talk about why myopia matters. Talk about the quality of life. 
talk about the blurry vision. You may have patient, you may have staff members or team members who don't know what it's like to be blurry. So it's incorporate important to, to really bring that about as well. And then bring up all the diseases that we treat in our office and how we want to stop the faucet, not just plug the drain. I think that we all are really interested in helping our patients that have maculopathy and glaucoma and retinal detachments and posterior cataracts. Those are patients that we're treating every single day. But what are we doing to stop the patients that are coming into the pool? And that's where myopia management is really at. And uh, in helping us to remember that the 80-year-old in our chair used to be the 88-year-old in somebody else's chair. And we can incorporate and impact the future of a generation by doing myopia management in our practice. Talk about the treatment options available, uh, orthokeratology, soft multifocals, atropine, spectacle lenses, the disadvantages and the advantages of all of those. And we can do a whole nother webinar on all that at some point. And then how do we as a team impact the, the prevalence and the importance of myopia management into our practice. So the importance of the myopia management discussion with the parent and the child. If the child's not on board, it's harder for the parent to get on board. Oftentimes I tell the parent that they need to parent and they need to select what's right for their kid, even if the kid is kind of like, no, nah, I don't want to do it, right? We work through that kind of like a child saying, no, I don't want to brush my teeth, right? So we incorporate the parenting, but we work through helping the child to understand what it, what it is and why it's important. Having our team members uh, practice with each other talking about myopia management, doing this role play, which I've learned from my industry counterparts um, about how good they do that, right? They've role played how to do a dry eye discussion about their product with you. And it's important for us to practice that before we hit the real life with our patients. What are some frequently asked questions? I go into the room and I do a consultation on myopia management and I get the same 10 questions from almost every single parent. So what are those? And maybe we come up with an FAQ for our office that answers some of those common questions. Discussing the program with our, 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 our uh, patients and discussing what the program looks like for the team as they're incorporating it in. Why do we have this as, as a program for our patients? Why is this different than a treatment of an eye drop for glaucoma or a treatment for macular degeneration? Why is this different? And the program is really because it's not something that's just for one year. This is gonna be something that parents and patients are gonna probably get into doing routinely year in and year out. And this is a program, not a treatment. And then how do the measurements come into play and how does each member of the team know how to do that? If you have technicians, opticians, front desk, you have back off, it depends on how you have that in your office, but every person has, plays a part into this. So sit down with each of them and talk as a team about how they see each person impacting this, right? Somebody needs to recall your myopia management patients every year, make sure that they know the importance of getting in for their yearly evaluation or their six month evaluation or three month or however it is often that you see the patient. Somebody may be responsible for ordering the lenses, right? Uh, if I'm ordering, say, as, as we discussed this Euclid lens, it requires K's HVID and uh, K's HVID as well as the refraction, you know, I don't necessarily have to do anything. I just see the patient from an exam standpoint. We make sure that the topography looks like we want it to do. I make sure the HVID looks the way I want it to do. And then the phone call or the email or the web portal can be done by one of my technicians. We also send our topographies off to our orthokeratology companies that we're working with. So that can be done. What if we're incorporating my site into our practice? Can a technician help the patient through understanding that process? Making sure that you have a champion, a myopia management champion on board who can walk patients through the process. And then training on the insertion or removal if it's a contact lens, 
doing glasses checking if it is a patient who's using spectacles, and then follow-ups from an atropine standpoint of calling in the prescription for an atropine. With training of contact lenses, the, the, there's been some studies that have been done looking at what's the difference between an adult and a child for the incorporation of contact lenses. And they showed that with a kid, it just takes longer to do the insertion and removal, but everything else is pretty much the same uh, with a contact lens. So incorporating an extra 10 to 15 minutes on the training and making sure that they know that they can come back, right? I know with orthokeratology, it tends to be a lot easier than soft lenses. So we don't always put as much time, but if they're learning how to do a soft lens, making sure that they have an idea what that's really going to look like. So uh, currently, uh, the vast majority of you have less than 25 patients in your, uh, in your myopia practice. Uh, and uh, that's, that's really cool that you're wanting to grow it. Um, and in the coming year, we want to gain an additional, the, the vast majority of you that answered this question are wanting to gain an additional 50 to 75, which would put you at about 100 or 75 to 100 total myopia management patients. Um, if you look at what the, what the various different amounts, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, I looked at their website on myopia management, and they were telling patients that the cost for myopia management ranges from about $1,000 to $4,000. So we're not talking prices here, but the American Academy of Ophthalmology's website says that. So if you just said that it was $1,000, which I'm not insinuating it should be, I probably think it should be more than that. But if it's $1,000 and you have 100 patients in myopia management, you just realize that that increased your revenue in your practice by $100,000. In addition, now you have 100 kids and their families, which are not progressing towards a really nasty disease. So a really, really cool part of myopia management into our practice. So now that we've talked to the parents and we've, we've kind of gotten on board, now we need to talk a little bit about finances. Uh, our good friend Dwight Ackerman did a podcast with me on August 4th where we talked about the business models and uh, Dwight has his MBA and I asked him to kind of dig into the business models of myopia management. And they're really mostly come into two platforms and I'm going to lean heavily on one that I think you should be doing. Um, and that is the global or all inclusive cost. The other one that people do is kind of an a la carte where they use they charge for the fitting and they charge for the lenses and they charge for the follow-ups. When you're doing that, to me, it seems like you're charging for the treatment, you're charging for the visit, you're charging for the product. And that really segments things as not as being just like glasses or contact lenses and contact lens follow-ups. Where I think in, that it works better, and several of our colleagues agree, Treehouse Eyes, I believe, does a global all-inclusive. And we have Matt Ording from Treehouse Eyes coming on in the coming weeks uh, and the Myopia podcast. But the all-inclusive approach ties the lens fitting as well as the lenses all into one cost. And the follow-up visits are generally included in that as well. What that looks like in my office is unless you're coming in with a medical condition, you got hit in the eye, you have an eye infection, maybe your eye is red, all of the visits regarding your myopia management are completely covered. So you can come in every month if you want to. Generally, that's not the case. We usually see our patients uh, for the first start, and then we see them for a six-month follow-up, and assuming everything is good, then we see them every year uh, and in every six months at least. But that first year, we tend to have a lot more visits right up front. Uh, and so we also have a higher fee for new patients than we do for established patients. Realizing these patients are getting into a program and they're starting, let's use orthokeratology as the example, they're starting orthokeratology. Well, most of the time, if you're doing any modifications to the fitting of the lenses, you're going to be doing that in the first couple of months of the patient wearing lenses. 
And in the first couple of months of the patients wearing lenses, then it's pretty well set and it works really well. Every year you may need to make a modification if the patient is advanced or if the lens isn't fitting as correctly, but you'll have less visits in those following appointments. So in my mind, we're also not having to talk with the parents as much. They're understanding the process. So in many offices across the country that have implemented myopia management, there is an, a different cost for established patients. And I think that's really a key for us as we, as we are looking at how we, uh, how we deal with our patients. Um, and uh, as, as, as we do that, I think it's important to lay everything out up front. And what we do is we have an initial program agreement a myopia management agreement that we have for our patients. And uh, whether they're going into any of the treatment options that are out there, the cost is pretty much the same because it's not the treatment that we're charging for. It's the, the uh, agreement of the program that we're doing. So the initials uh, are involved in this, and I know you can't see the details of this particular paper, but you can see how there is lines and the patient is going through what happens if they discontinue, right? So if they do want to discontinue within a certain number of days, we give them 50% uh, of their money back. If there's loss or if there's breakage of a lens or they don't like the prescription anymore and they need to switch their lenses, right? And you figure out how all of that works with your contact lens company that you're dealing with or your spectacle lens company if you're dealing with that. How does a warranty work and how does follow-up visits And this is also where we discuss with our parents the risk factors. And not only the parents, but the patients as well. And have uh, it's a good idea to have a line for the patient as well as the parents to sign, understanding that if my eye is red, if I notice that my vision is unusually blurry, whatever it may be that you feel is important, that you slide that into the agreement and so that everybody is on board right up front. I find that with the initialing of each separate, separate section, they read it more closely and uh, they pay attention to more. And then we have a team member or myself or my resident will go through this with them. The third page in our agreement is uh, educational. It's about risk factors. It's about why we want them to do myopia management because not everybody moves forward on the first day. Uh, we may present this to mom or to dad during a, an initial visit and they need to take it home to their spouse and present it. We lay this out as a contract of how we do things. Of course, I'm not super rigid in my office. If we need to make something fair for our patients, then we're gonna take care of them. Uh, but if you're really strict on that sort of stuff, it might be something that you would uh, want to um, have an attorney look over as well. Uh, so some key things there, having that paperwork up front can really be important. One thing I want to bring up is having something like a warranty or a replacement program in place. And we do this with all of our specialty contact lenses. Um, with a soft daily disposable like MySight or NatraView, you don't need this as much because you're able to get you know, some lenses or replacements with your representative. But with orthokeratology, we charge uh, a little over our cost for our warranty. And we don't care what happens to the lens. If they want to cheat us and ask for a separate pair of lenses six months into it, we don't ask any questions. I, maybe somebody's done that. I think most people are relatively honest. Um, so if they break a lens, if they lose a lens, you know, if they just want another one and they don't want to buy it, if they're okay with cheating the system, they can get this and there's no questions asked. And, uh, you know, most people are pretty happy to have this warranty program in place and uh, it works out very well because if they need to get a new lens, it can be very expensive and we set that up. One of the things with regards to frequently asked questions that I did for my patients, and we've posted it, it's had about 50,000 views online, is answering some common questions that patients may have about myopia management and how it's important and it's a worldwide thing. And then we can give this to prospective parents. We can send this out to pediatricians. We can send this out to other individuals to talk to them about myopia management. It helps answer frequent questions 
and so forth. So myopia management, we need to create the demand in our practice, right? And we, we kind of talk about all of these aspects with patients who are walking in, but how do we get outside patients to be referred into our practice? First of all, I think it's about talking about it, starting with our internal practice and talking to every person. Every myope that you have, regardless of the age, you can talk to them about, you know, there are some things that we could have done if you were a child to slow this down. And if you have children who are myopic, we can help slow down the progression of their nearsightedness. Or if you have grandchildren who are nearsighted, or you know the one of the risks of you developing this glaucoma that you have, Mr. Jones or Mrs. Jones, you have you know macular degeneration. We see that it probably has an association with your nearsightedness, and we now have some things to help slow that down, and that may create a conversation uh, over Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, over Christmas dinner or, uh, you know, a holiday, and all of a sudden now you have created this demand. There are some things around marketing that we could talk further about. Uh, Dr. Elise Kramer and Dr. Stephanie Wu uh, were just on our podcast and they talked about marketing a specialty lens, but th that includes things like digging into Google ads, which may sound really crazy to you or Facebook ads or Instagram ads. You may want to reach out with a letter to pediatric optometrist, ophthalmologist, um, and also pediatricians' offices and start sharing information about myopia. Go to your local service clubs and give a presentation on myopia and things that can be done, right? Uh, that may just not just bring people into your office, but it might bring in some, to somebody other, somebody else's office, another optometrist or another ophthalmologist or another contact lens fitter that can help those people. And so you're spreading the myopia message, even if it's just not directly impacting you, but oftentimes it does. You know, as we look at implementing myopia management into our practices, it can be really kind of daunting because it's so new. <clears throat> what I've found in doing this is as I have become more repulsed by myopia as a disease, my success with myopia management has improved. I've gone up, I've done more of them because I've just seen those glaucoma and the macular degeneration patients. I've just seen how that is affecting patients so much and I've just become repulsed by it and I don't want any kids to develop those conditions as they get older. So we've started talking with it, started you know bringing it up to our team and it's just been part of our team. We've been doing it I've been doing it for 15 years and I've owned my practice for not quite that long, but it's been a part about it, uh, part of it ever since. And every year, the number of myopia management patients increase in our practice. And that's the beauty about it is that if you enroll people into a program, I mean, it helps on the business side of things, but it also is really cool to see this 17 and 19 year old that I alluded to earlier their myopia has not progressed. They're a minus 10 and a minus seven. And their myopia has not progressed for the last number of years. And it's been so great to be able to see how impactful that has been, particularly to their mother, but also to the kids who are noticing that their prescription is not changing. Um, I do want to, again, thank Euclid uh, for their support of the Myopia podcast as we're getting started. Again, uh, if you don't do orthokeratology, uh, one of the things that the FDA requires us to do is go through a certification of any of the orthokeratology companies. And they're not hard. I've done many of them. And, you know, we've got incredible lenses that are on the market. So you'll need to go through a certification with a lens lab. And then uh, once you do that, then you're able to uh, go ahead and order the lenses. And if you haven't done it and you know you want to consider utilizing Euclid, you can get your first set of lenses for free for mentioning uh, this webinar or the Myopia podcast. And uh, you know, I could talk for another hour or two with you about myopia, how we're doing it in our practice, how we've really enjoyed helping so many of our patients. 
Um, but I will let you go. I do want to bring up that we do have the podcast and I get to talk to the best of the best in the myopia world. Uh, I've been in myopia for 15 years, but getting to hear all of these individuals talk about it, uh, I think you would enjoy it as much as, uh, hopefully as much as I do, and you'll get to learn a lot. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.